Something's different. I can't quite put my finger on it. <laughs> everybody welcome back to the channel my name is kevin i am a geek you are watching kevin the geek and it is time for another new who doctor who review i am currently on my way to 100 subscribers please do subscribe to the channel if you are new welcome to everyone who is a returning viewer and today we are going to dive into a parallel world for our first two-parter story of the season now, if you are new to the channel and to my Doctor Who reviews, every Doctor Who review gets a score out of 100, made up of scores out of 10 for 10 different categories. When I do a multi-episode story, I do the reviews encompassing all of the episodes into one story. So this one is going to cover both episodes, Rise of the Cybermen and The Age of Steel. Now the first thing, not really going to count towards any scoring in this episode, but what frustrates me, how many times in Doctor Who you have a first part of a, you know, two part or three part or four part or whatever, where basically the title of the episode gives away what is going to happen. Now, for me admittedly, when I first watched The Rise of the Cybermen and The Age of Steel, I didn't know anything about the Cybermen. I knew of the Daleks, I didn't know the Cybermen. So the fact that you have this humongous climax to the end of the first episode, where the Doctor learns that it's the Cybermen, and you know, it, then you have this big massive reveal with all this explosion of glass and the Cybermen breaking into the party. If you kind of knew of the Cybermen from you know being a fan of Classic Who or you know, you watch other episodes, then it's not really that much of a surprise and it feels a bit of a letdown. So, minor issue there, and unfortunately this isn't contained to just this episode, but, you know, these things happen. So let's actually talk about the Cybermen themselves. Now, of course, I have seen a couple of classic Who stories with them, so this was the first opportunity to try and modernise and bring the Cybermen into the modern day. Now, first of all, I love the actual look of the Cybermen. I love the fact that they're, you know, pure metal, you know, they're actually kind of properly steel, and it kind of fits in with the fact that the Cybermen were kind of made in, you know, modern day London. Okay, yes, this is on a parallel world, but equally in the real universe you could easily you know, have it that that is where they came from and it's a really nice design for them now admittedly the one when john lumic got made into the cyber leader cyber controller and the fact that it was in this big chair still and he had all these wires hooked into him that still makes no sense to me you can understand why John Lumic was in that situation while he was a man, but the whole idea of making him Cyberman is so that he doesn't have to worry about that. So in theory, he should just be able to walk around as normal. Again, a little bit of a nitpick, but these are the kind of things that I personally pick up on. Now, the whole delete thing, it felt like an opportunity for them to try and shove in a catchphrase. At first, I thought that had always been a thing for the Cybermen, and that was something that they said. But I actually learned that they introduced it into this story. And so it feels a bit of a cheap exploitation and trying to capitalise on the whole Daleks and their exterminate catchphrase. So now that I realise that fully, I'm not a huge fan at the time. I thought it was okay, but now, not so much, I, would, I wouldn't say. Now, talking with the Doctor and the companions and things, I want to start this episode with Mickey. Because I feel, in my opinion, this is actually Mickey's episode, rather than it being the Doctor's or it being Rose's. First of all, huge credit to Noel Clark when he has to play Mickey and Ricky. Because I tell you what, that scene 
where Ricky gets killed, and then Mickey's on the other side of the fence, and he does like the little <laughs> sniff. You really don't know whether that is Ricky or Mickey. And, of course, Noel Clark would have had to figure out all these little subtle things. And he did a really good job in them. And also doing a really good job in showing two very, very different versions of the same character. And I really like that he actually got some character development in this episode. Because up until now, he's just been this sort of sidekick to Rose and just been there. Bit of comedy effects, a little bit of heroism at times. And here, he's come full circle from the episode School Reunion, where he says, no, I don't want to just be the sidekick and the technical support and all this kind of stuff. I actually want to do things. I'm capable of doing things. Because I think he sees the stuff that Rose and the Doctor do together... And maybe he thinks that they think that he's not capable of doing them. When he is, he just needs that opportunity to shine. And he's got all these people down to him. He's got the Doctor. He's got Rose. He's got Jake. He's got Ricky. He's got Mrs. Moore in, in the episode. All these different people basically saying, you can't do this. Well, he proves them wrong. And it was a great episode for Mickey. And I thought it was a great decision, and a brave decision actually, to make him stay in this parallel universe because I think he needed it. You know, he has literally been this little puppy hanging on to Rose ever since she left him all the way back in the first episode of the first season. He is now finally getting out there on his own and being a man of his own two feet. And he had to stay in this parallel world to do so. And I remember thinking at the time, this is literally the last you're going to see of Mickey. And in a way, I almost wish that we hadn't seen him again. That would have been such a perfect send-off to him. Now, coming on to the Doctor and Rose, I think it's now becoming apparent that these two are really entwined with each other and sometimes almost to dangerous levels. But Rose is really beginning to take command, as she shows to the Doctor in the second part, when he says... No stopping you, is there? Nope. But they had some really good dynamics between them throughout the episode and it shows, I think, at this point, even this early in, how good of a pairing Ten and Rose really are together. Definitely more so, I think, than Nine and, and Rose because I think Rose, although I don't personally like it, the sort of younger, friendly, flirty banter, I think, between them. It works for these two. Like I said, I'm not a big fan of it. I'm not going to lie. But it works for them. Just not my cup of tea. But Rose has a very difficult situation in this episode. The fact that she's in a parallel world, and it's a world where her father is alive. And I just knew straight away that they were going to kill off Jackie and they were going to leave Pete. It'd be like a complete role reversal and maybe they could do something with it in the future. It was so predictable. It's a little bit of a downbeat for me with, with the story in that regard. But, you know, the way that they did it, it was it was good. Bit bit of nice fun dialogue in, in the party scene that, that featured in them. Um... But again, this sort of jealousy from Rose is coming out to the front. And it's it's really apparent how, you know, how jealous she is. And she's, you know, she's clearly in love with, with the Doctor, you know, particularly Ten. So, yeah, there, there's some good and bad stuff with it. As for the Doctor, the Doctor was really, really good. For me, the biggest biggest and best scene that David Tennant had in this one was all the stuff with Mrs. Moore and they're going through the cooling tunnels and they're just having this nice conversation as they're going towards this dangerous place and Mrs. Moore puts an EMP on the Cyberman to take it out and you could tell how impressed he is with her technical knowledge and you know it takes a lot for the Doctor to be impressed but I really like what they did there in, in that regard of course, it gave them the answer in, in how to stop them, how to stop the Cybermen. And the the moment where Mrs. Moore got killed and 
the doctor's response is like, no, you didn't have to kill her. It's, it was a really good and really strong episode, I think, for the Doctor in this regard. The supporting cast were really strong. You know, Jake w was was pretty good. Um, obviously, Ricky I've kind of already spoken about. But like I said, Mrs. Moore, I really love that character. And I'm so gutted that we didn't get to see any more of her. Um, but what we did see, she was fantastic. And, Maybe it's because she's Welsh, you know, and I'm a little bit prejudiced, I think, towards the Welsh. Because I love the Welsh, I love their accent. But, you know, it, it was a really good character that she portrayed. And I love their little backstory that she had as well. Jake, we never really got a backstory, nor so did we really with Ricky. So I was really good that at least we got it for Mrs. Moore. Because it just gave us a bit more of an understanding, you know. Although, I'll tell you what, one one person who I felt was a little bit wasted was actually Don Warrington, who played the President of the United Kingdom. Don Warrington is such a distinguished actor. And if you've never seen the TV detective series Death in Paradise, please go and watch it. A, because it's a freaking great TV show, but B, he is phenomenal in that show. But aside from that, what he had to do here was quite limited, quite basic. You know, he did a good job of what he needed to do. But as a performer, Don Warrington, I really wish we got something more from him there. And of course, we have to talk about Roger Lloyd Pack, who played John Lumick, the creator of the Cybermen. And he surprised me. It's not someone who I really think of as being kind of synonymous with drama and deeper roles. For me, I think of him in The Vicar of Dibley and It Only Falls on Horses. But here, he did a really solid performance. It wasn't the best, and I don't think the writing particularly helped him out there a lot. But, you know, he did a really good, solid job. The rest of the things are kind of more back of the, the scene stuff. You know, your story, your special effects, the, the set, the costumes, all that kind of stuff. For the most part, they were, you know, reasonably good and solid. Nothing you could really scream out uh, about home about. You know, they were really good. The music was, you know, again, like I've said before, it's getting better and better and better. But, you know, set, it's modern day. You know, didn't help that we had some weird CGI blimps in in london which just didn't look that great um the special effects when they were converting people you see all the machinery kind of converting the people into sidemen that didn't look great there so again there are some criticisms i have to say oh i tell you what i've just remembered music wise the stupid ridiculous scene where john lumix business part or whatever he gets the people off the street and he converts them into cybermen and the guy's like oh i don't like that noise and he plays the lion sleeps tonight what a weird song and what a weird choice that that just made no sense to me then and it still makes no sense to me now and speaking of that character right the other thing I didn't get, and it's for me, it was a really poor piece of dialogue and writing for, for this bit. It's the bit in the second episode where, you know, I think they're maybe going to try and convert him or whatever, and he like takes the earpods out, and then he goes in, goes to speak John Lumick, and he's like, "I've been with you a long time, sir. I'm, I know exactly what I'm going." And he, you know, and he basically destroys John Lumick's chair, like. That just felt like that came out of nowhere. All through the previous episode, he's been going on and doing his bidding and, you know, doing it, you know, fine. But then, weirdly, out of nowhere, he seems to have a big, massive moral problem with it. Yeah, really weird there. So, overall, I would say really solid episode. Wasn't amazing, you know? But it was definitely an above average episode, without a shadow of a doubt. But let's take a look at the actual scores. The story gets 8, the Doctor gets 7, Rose gets 7, the supporting characters get 8, 
The villains get seven. The music gets seven. Special effects, seven. The dialogue, six. Costumes, seven. The set, six. So what does that mean for the final scores? It means that The Rise of the Cybermen and The Age of Steel gets 70 marks out of 100, which means it's a B minus episode. So definitely a reasonably strong introduction to the Cybermen. I think they did just about enough of a job to, you know, for people who weren't actual fans and didn't know what the Cybermen were, they did enough to kind of explain what they were and quite how scary they were in actual fact as well but in a good way that made them kind of up to date and modern and kind of tying in a little bit with modern society so a really really good episode there so lots of content is out at the moment and lots more to look forward to in the coming weeks this week hogwarts legacy the video game got released and i am doing some daily streams this week so please do watch my videos in relation to that and then I'll be moving and doing a weekly stream on a Sunday for Hogwarts Legacy. Tune in tomorrow again at 6 o'clock to see my review of Ted Lasso Series 1 Episode 6, Two Aces. Please go back and check out my Black Panther movie review that I released on Monday. And of course next week we have got Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania getting released on the Friday. So my plan is to release a spoiler-free review, maybe on the Saturday, at least by the Sunday. And then on the Monday, I will be releasing my full-blown review, complete with spoilers. So if you don't want to miss anything, please subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell, and you'll know when I go live. But for now, my name's Kevin, I'm a geek, and you have been watching Kevin the Geek. Goodbye.